Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we're going to be discussing price gouging, the economic fallacy of emergency situations, from my blog post by the same name. According to Learn Liberty, the term price gouging is defined as Quote, raising prices on certain kinds of goods to an unfair or excessively high level during an emergency. End quote. The phrase itself carries with it quite a pejorative connotation of extorting the consumer by gouging out his wallet. As with most economic fallacies, this deception is exposed with a simple logical review of the circumstances surrounding its employment. The price mechanism, as with all other aspects of free market capitalism, is intimately responsive to the oscillating nature of supply and demand. Constant feedback is necessary between entrepreneur and patron. This is why when, quote, government takes over a sector of society, the result is always shortages, surpluses, and inevitable devastation. By its very artificial monopolistic nature, government completely bypasses and ignores the signals of supply and demand that determine the optimal price of a given product. These natural market forces are absolutely corrupted when government introduces violence into a previously peaceful equation. The signals of supply and demand regarding staples are no more exaggerated than during a natural disaster, national emergency, or in times of war. Human desires are infinite and resources are scarce. It follows that the pricing of items must closely reflect what the people want and the degree to which they want it. A finite item that is in low demand due to relative abundance or during peacetime is comparably undesired by the people. Therefore, one will see lower prices to reflect this. An example of this is gas prices during peacetime yielding a low price in the market. The finite, a finite item that is in high demand due to relative scarcity or during times of hardship is comparably more desired by the people. Therefore, one will see higher prices to reflect this. An example of this is gas prices during warfare or after a natural disaster. Hurricane, earthquake, tsunami, tornado, etc. These high prices, higher prices are helpful for the conservation of scarce resources and for their allocation to those who truly need them and who are willing to pay the higher prices. For example, price controls on gasoline, as we had after Hurricane Sandy, only serve to exhaust the supply to those who bought and hoarded as much gasoline as possible, leaving the vast majority without. The result was long lines and disproportionate allocation of gasoline. Higher prices would have solved this as people would only have purchased what they truly needed they would have been incentivized to conserve gasoline and consume less. Some people believe that prices are arbitrarily determined by greedy capitalist pigs who can charge whatever price they want and the public is forced to pay. This is a vast oversimplification of reality and of human behavior. Businesses do not exist in a vacuum. They are constantly subjected to the forces of competition as exerted by other businesses in their field and in other fields. This ensures that whatever price one business charges for a product, another business will seek to gain patronage by undercutting them with slightly lower prices or by offering a better quality product. This is true even in an emergency environment and will therefore guarantee that prices for a given item will not be arbitrarily determined by any single business. 
in a vain attempt to justify the existence of the self-licking ice cream cone that is government. There currently are 34 states that have anti-price gouging laws that prohibit the natural ra raising of prices to reflect the rise in demand and the strangulation of the small business owner and entrepreneur. Stop believing in the myth known as government. Free yourself from delusion and you will know prosperity. I end with a quote by the um, economist Thomas Sowell. With various people complaining about price gouging, economist Walter Williams has coined an, a new term, tax gouging. But government is never accused of either greed or gouging. Not even when they bulldoze people's homes in order to turn the land over to businesses that will pay more taxes. All right. Price gouging. An interesting phenomenon that many of us um, are not familiar with unless we are confronted with a natural disaster or an emergency situation. Um, and we kind of, uh, you know, always think that it's uh, kind of normal, right, during such uh, catastrophic times to see long lines and shortages and surpluses, right? We kind of have been taught to believe that this is normal. However, this is not normal. This is, as um, most sectors of our society that um, have been perverted and corrupted by government intervention, um, this is completely abnormal and uh, indicative of, uh, of illness, right? So, so price gouging, uh, you know, just, just think about that term, price gouging. It's, it seems very um, vicious, violent, and aggressive, right? You know, you, you get the picture of uh, entrepreneurs, you know, just charging whatever they want, taking advantage of the victims of emergencies right the victims of uh, natural disasters and you know they need water they need food so they charge whatever they want right but uh, you know the truth is that they they only can charge um, the amount of money that other businesses um, can compete with them for right so so uh, sure the prices go up during an emergency however you know, this is an attractive offer to other businesses, let's say, who, who sell, let's say, generators, right? And they, the price of generators goes up in a particular region. And so those businesses would be more attracted to the emergency region than would be, um, and would, you know, for a desire to make a profit, they would go to that region and sell their, um, sell their generators for more money than they normally would, right? And so they would attempt in this way to quench the demand, right? And over time, as, as the various businesses who sell these generators, let's say, uh, they compete with each other, you know, lower, lower prices, right, to win over customers and patrons, um, eventually that demand will be satisfied, will be quenched, and, and prices will revert back to parity, right? As uh, rebuilding and re reconstruction occurs and the emergency situation is relieved, right? So this is just a natural an example of a natural market mechanism to respond to um, uh, temporary shortages that have occurred as a result of uh, natural disasters or emergency situations. So, so, um, so that's one aspect is, uh, you know, the idea of price gouging tries to vilify the entrepreneur for um, victimizing, you know, the, uh, the customer. That's one uh, myth or misunderstanding. And the other one is that um, politicians, through the use of government, through the use of laws, mandates, produce wealth, right? That um, they see inequities in the market and through scribbling on pieces of paper, right? They can produce wealth. <laughs> so... This uh, is a pretty pervasive myth. Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, 
don't take the time to examine the idiocy of such an assertion, right? If politicians truly could create wealth at a whim, um, why would we need businesses at all, right? Why do we need anything? You know, why, why don't politicians just, uh, you know, write on pieces of paper, right? Um, humans will live this long. Uh, <laughs> everybody will be well fed, <laughs> right? Um, or in the case of uh, the Federal Reserve, right, printing pieces of paper, you know, and calling it money, when in fact it is, um, can be more accurately termed as currency or Federal Reserve notes or a contract or an IOU or a promissory note. Um, this is not wealth, right, in the same sense that, um, you know, the abundance cannot be created or produced by, um, you know, arbitrary whims and threats of punishment um, handed down by our rulers or political masters. This is a, a completely erroneous assumption. So, um, so yeah. So if that if that were true, right? In order to create prosperity, the Federal Reserve need only to um, you know add on a bunch of zeros to the pieces of paper, right? And we'd all be rich, right? <laughs> Give everybody, uh, you know, have the federal government print, you know. $5,000 for every American citizen, and we would all be rich, right? Um, so why is this not so, right? Because wealth and prosperity and abundance certainly do not come from the top. They don't come from our masters, our rulers, our tyrants and presidents. No, they only come from the bottom, right? Those, the people who are willing to work and invent and innovate, the entrepreneurs who open up businesses, create jobs, increase the standard of living of those around him um, through technological progress, through the application of new ideas, new concepts right, in, uh, in manufacturing, in production. Um, this is how wealth is created. This is how abundance is created. This is how, this is how progress occurs. Right? So, we have to understand that. Any, any intervention done by our political masters must result in a worsening of the human condition, in a lowering of the standard of living. It must occur that way. Um, Because the market, you can, you can think of the market as, uh, you know, some people like to consider the market, you know, especially politicians, of course, or status people, those who believe in, in government, um, like to believe that the market, or say the free market, um, is like a savage animal that needs to be tamed, needs to be chained, right? Or else it's, gonna, it's just going to destroy everything in its path. It's just vicious. You know, we are... Human beings are at heart vicious creatures, right? We have base desires. We only wish to abuse, extort, assault, rape, and kill our neighbor if given the chance, right? That is our nature. This is what, this is what the belief in government eventually boils down to. And that without special people, special group of people calling themselves government, in society, forcefully restricting, caging, and taming that uh, supposed uh, savage nature, <laughs> humanity would annihilate itself, right? <laughs> we would self-destruct. Um, whereas, the truth is that uh, most of the... Um, Democide, genocide, mass murder, wars in history have only resulted from the belief in government, from the belief in authority, in the myth of authority, from the belief that our, the people that were born in this geographical region are in some sense superior from the people born in a different geographical region, right? And that they are different, they are our enemies. Right? There are foreigners. <laughs> so this concept, this, you can see this, how this concept of a nation state is very divisive, right? Um, and just uh, 
breaks people into into categories and just um, yeah divides us. So it's inherently destructive. This line of reason, this line of thinking, statism, right? It's inherently destructive, and um, and obliterating to our to you know the human condition, right? So we must realize that destruction is not economically beneficial, right? It is economically um, damaging. It's a net loss, right? Um, you can forcefully subjugate someone to work on your field, right? And, you know, let's say pick cotton, right? Or any kind of, uh, any kind of crop. And you can whip them and you can force them and you can uh, monitor them, right? Or you can pay them and they'll do that voluntarily. Now, which do you think is more difficult to do? Which do you think yields the greatest profit, the greatest abundance and increases the standard of living, right? There are ways to interact with our fellow human beings in, that are much more efficient and conveniently much more nonviolent. <laughs> so price gouging is a way that politicians can vilify entrepreneurs for delivering the goods and services that are need, needed in a particular, particularly deprived region, right? Let's say Hurricane Sandy, you know, you have... You know, Hurricane Sandy comes around, destroys houses, destroys, you know, power lines. People um, have no power, have no lights, you know, can't cook their food, things like that. Um, so, you know, gas immediately, um, the, the, the demand for gasoline goes up, right, as uh, people require that to power their generators, right, to put on lights and things like that and maybe cook. Um, so... Gasoline, right, as any commodity, is finite, right? It's scarce, right? Therefore, if it must adjust, the price of that commodity must adjust naturally to the demand, to the change in demand, right? So, you know, during peacetime, that demand is uh, quite low, right? People need gas, but, you know, they're not in dire need of it. But in times of emergency situations, um, they absolutely require it for survival, right? And, and so, you know, the prices must go up in order to meet with that demand. And what this does is ensures the proper allocation of gasoline, right, to those people that truly need it, right? Those people that are willing to pay, let's say, I don't know, let's say $8, $7, $8 a gallon as opposed to $3 a gallon you know, in peacetime. So that during, war, during, during an, an emergency, people are, who really need the gas, let's say, to heat their homes or to go to work, you know, they need it. It's economically beneficial for them to spend that amount of money on the gas. They will. Other people who don't really need it, why would they, why would they buy it, right? Why, why would they want to buy it at that, at that price, right? That it's, doesn't make sense for them. They don't need it, right? So you can see how in that way, raising prices actually um, does you know, confers a benefit to the people, right? It ensures the proper allocation of the scarce resource, in this case, gasoline, right? So what eventually uh, ended up happening was, um, um, you know, the state of New York um, decided to, um, I guess, in, perhaps in, uh, in cooperation with the federal government, maybe, uh, they decided to fix the price of gasoline to where it was before, you know, maybe three dollars, three fifty. And what was the result of this? You had extremely long lines, you had hoarding, you had people who would, you know, buy up all the gasoline at these extremely cheap prices because they knew everybody needed it and you know, or many people needed it in the, in the area and are willing to pay higher prices. And so they buy these ultra cheap prices and then they, they sell it back to the, the other people at you know obscene uh, profits. Um, and it's just, it was just a tragedy, you know, people, um, there was a lot of suffering at that time, um, and it was completely unnecessary, and, and I believe also there were trucks that were on their way to delivering the gasoline to the gas stations, but, you know, they decided, no, why would we deliver to an area that, <laughs> you know, the, um, 
the demand is high, but the prices are artificially lowered due to price controls, um, and they know they can get a higher price, why would, they, why would they deliver their product to an area where they know they can get higher prices, right? So they withheld the delivery of the gasoline during that time, primarily because the government intervened, right, and forcefully fixed prices to a certain level, right? Um, because our um, control freaks, the political masters, are trying to uh, be merciful, <laughs> trying to be benevolent, when in fact they end up injuring and harming the people even more so in the process. Right, so, so we have to understand that where wealth comes from, right, where does wealth originate? Um, because, you know, and this is kind of interesting in light of um, Hillary Clinton's recent, uh, <laughs> her recent statement that was uh, all over Facebook, um, you know, she said, don't let anyone tell you that businesses and corporations create jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is just fascinating. I mean, it's not surprising, but it's just amazing how these um, sociopaths are not even hiding the fact they're contempt for entrepreneurs and, and business owners. You know, they're not even hiding it anymore. Like, they actually think that by writing on pieces of paper and by sending, you know, armed mercenaries with guns to enforce them, that creates jobs. You know, they actually believe that. <laughs> and it's kind of sad, you know, how can you, how can you force the creation of jobs? It's like, if something happens spontaneously, you know, how can you force the creation of education in a child? You know, how do you force um, the invention of, you know, let's say the iPhone. How do you force these things? These things are not forced. These things occur. They, they're inspired, right? They occur spontaneously. Um, these things have nothing to do with force. They have nothing to do with guns or laws or regulations or taxes or government. They have nothing to do with that. And um, the farther that we can get away from such authoritarian institutions, um, uh, you know, uh, farther we can get from the monopoly on violence known as government, the more prosperous and abundant our society will be. I have no doubt. I have no doubt that people can provide for themselves given the freedom, given the economic freedom to do so. You know, um, so, so, again, wealth comes from the bottom. It's like, it's like a tree like a plant you know wealth doesn't come from the leaves doesn't come from the top of the tree it comes from the roots right you know you have a good strong root system that's nourished well hydrated with with nutrients you will have a powerful resilient tree you know with uh, many fruits and leaves um, so the roots are us there are brothers and sisters, your neighbors, the small shopkeeper, you know, the, uh, the business owner. These are the, the creators of wealth. And when you, see, when you see companies leaving the country, like for example Burger King fleeing to Canada, or you know, other, other uh, corporations like uh, Peter Schiff, Europe Pacific Metals, he moved his he moved his company to Puerto Rico, or you know other companies. They move their they move their companies to tax havens, tax shelters, areas of the world where there's um, significantly lower tax rates of taxation than the United States. You know some people look at the, the look at that kind of move and say you know how dare you that's so unpatriotic you're abandoning the United States you know you're killing jobs we need jobs here stay here. Again, blaming the victim, blaming the rape victim, blaming the victim of theft, blaming the assault victim. We have to look at who's doing the robbing, who's doing the assaulting, and who's doing the murdering. All right, because it's not the business owner, right? They want 
to serve the public. They want to provide the highest quality product and service that they can. So what's stopping them? We have to look at the incentive. What is incentivizing them to leave the country? <laughs> they act not on a whim. They act for good reason, right? It takes a lot of inertia and energy to, to move a company out of a country. <laughs> That's not an easy thing to do, right? So if, if a business owner decides to do that, you really have to ask, why is he doing that, right? What is different in Mexico that's different than here, right? And, uh, and if you're honest with yourself, you will come to the conclusion that, uh, you know, the amount of laws in this country, the amount of regulations in this country, and the amount of taxation in this country is just abominable. It is vile. It is reprehensible. And it's completely understandable that somebody would not want to leave and... Uh, would want to leave and, and keep as much of their profits as possible. You know, the, the more profits that a company can keep, that's more, um, more revenue to be reinvested into the business, right? To grow the business, to hire new, cust to hire new, uh, new employees, to, to grow the business, to, you know, um, buy more equipment, to things like that, you know, um, get more space, you know, whatever to grow the business, that money can be reinvested and, grow, and, and the, the more the business grows, um, also that benefits, that directly benefits the population and that, that's jobs being created right there. Um, whereas when a business is uh, subjected to, you know, 40%, 50%, 60% of its profits taxed away, stolen, and given to a rapacious, murderous, genocidal government. <laughs> Is that moral? Is that just? Did, did government earn that money or did they just take it because of their supposed domination? Their control of the police and the military of brute force. Right? It's, it's the business owners and the entrepreneurs that, you know, take all the risk. They invest all this capital. They put up all the money. And it's a gamble. It's a risk going into, uh, you know, being self-employed, you know. And, and people do it because there's a possibility for return, right? For becoming wealthy, right? That's, that's the incentive to going into, uh, you know, becoming an entrepreneur, right? Everybody, um, <laughs> imagine, like in communism... If there's no incentive, if there's no incentive for, for becoming wealthy or successful, then what's the purpose of innovating and creating anything, right? What's the purpose of, of uh, going into business at all, right? There is, there's no incentive anymore. You've killed, you've killed the incentive. Just like in a child that goes to school, you've killed the desire to learn. Don't be surprised when no learning occurs after that. You know, in a communist country, don't be surprised when nobody wants to create, nobody wants to innovate anymore. You know, the, the cars are crap, you know, the cars are crappy and useless and decrepit, all right? The technology, the, the computers are crappy, nobody wants to buy the You know, it, this is not surprising at all when you understand the incentives that are created, you know, in a uh, relatively more free society as opposed to a um, more totalitarian or social, socialistic society, right? So... So this is what we have to realize, you know, the, the small business owner, the entrepreneur, he is not your enemy, okay? He is not your foe. He's on your side. And these lunatics, these idiots in the Ferguson riots who have resorted to looting and, uh, you know, pillaging shopkeepers destroying windows and destroying merchandise <laughs> to make a point it's just madness <laughs> to think that that's going to create any kind of positive change by destroying a window or setting fire to merchandise is that is that going to help our situation you're cutting off your left arm 
right? Entrepreneurs are, are part of us. They are on our side. These are the people that are serving you, that are making your life better, and you're looting them? Please study some economics, study some true history. Do yourself a favor, educate yourself. Think, it's not illegal yet. And even if it was illegal, I would still do it. <laughs> so I'm gonna end right there. This is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care, bye.